welcome every, everyone. Um, as you can see, this meeting is being recorded. We do want to make sure that folks that can't attend these open houses are able to get the information that they need about the, uh, the bicycle plan for Jefferson County. And again, we're very grateful that you're um, here to learn about the plan, provide input, uh, and, and work together to um, improve bicycling and transportation in the county. Uh, I'm Daniel Estes. I'm with CDR Associates on the project team. And we do have a relatively full agenda. With less people, we might be able to get through things a little bit uh, faster. Uh, but we do want to get into the substance here pretty quickly. So I'm going to go over the agenda very quickly. If you want to go to the next slide, Trung, thank you. Um, so we have a presentation, so about the bicycle plan, um, what the plan does, um, what, it, what the goals are, what its focus is, and that should take about 20 minutes. We have some uh, questions for you all interspersed with that presentation. And then um, with this small of a group, we might forego on the breakout discussions, but we will hone in on the uh, mountains and plains regions of the plan and take a closer look at those and those um, what would have been the breakout discussions and we might still get there depending on if we have more people joining um, as I see more people joining us right now um, th that will be an opportunity to really have more in-depth discussion ask the project team questions learn about the plan um, and then we'll come back to the full full group debrief and, uh, and have some additional time for any, um, any more questions and answers. So that's our agenda for the evening. Again, uh, I see a few people joining. So if you're here to talk about the Jefferson County Bicycle Plan, you're in the right place. Um, and, uh, and here we're just gonna go over some meeting basics. Um, so we are encouraging you all to speak up, especially looks like we do have a relatively smaller group tonight. Um, so feel free to take yourself off mute, uh, throw your camera on if you're comfortable with it. Uh, we want this to be interactive. Um, and uh, so rather than using the chat box, uh, please feel free to, to provide verbal input. Um, as we mentioned, this will be uh, recorded, at least the first half will be, uh, so that we can make sure that others who aren't present are able to get the information that they need. It'll be posted on the website following the meeting. And then, as I said, when we're in the interactive portions, we always love to see people's faces. So uh, please consider turning your camera on if you're comfortable with that. Um, and with that, uh, we are about to get into the presentation, but very quickly, I do want to introduce the project team that's been working really hard over these past few months to get this plan to where it's at. So um, again, I'm Daniel Estes, I'm with CDR Associates, and maybe we'll just go around the horn here. And, and when I uh, call your name, project team, you can uh, say who you are, your organization, and uh, what you've been working on on the plan. So maybe we'll start with our Jefferson County folk, uh, Christina. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Christina Lane. I'm the transportation planner here at the county um, and one of the project managers. Awesome. Thanks, Christina. Uh, Yelena? Hello, Yelena Onan, the Transportation Operations Planning Manager at the county and the co-manager of the project. Wonderful. Thank you, Yelena. And um, let's go to uh, Trung. Good evening, everyone. My name is Trung. Um, I'm with a consultant called Tool Design, and we've been working uh, with the county on this plan. Wonderful. Thanks, Trung. And Josh. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Josh Malin with Apex Design. Uh, we've been supporting with the uh, mountain um, network development and prioritization. Fantastic. Thanks, Josh. And last but not least, uh, Tabor Ward. Hi, my name is Tabor Ward, and I'm Daniel's colleague and help with the stakeholder outreach and facilitation work. Awesome. Thanks, all. Um, we appreciate that. And uh, without further ado, unless there is anything to add, project team, I think we can jump into the presentation, and I will turn it over to Trung. All right, thanks, Daniel. And, and at this point, I think I, I may go ahead and relieve um, a couple of folks from our, our consultant team um, just to right size for, for the attendees in this group. So, so Tabor and Josh, thank you for jumping on, and we'll uh, we'll see you we'll see you soon. Um, and then uh, everyone else is going to hang on, and uh, we're going to we're going to dive into uh, about a twenty minute presentation. We do have a couple of interactive questions that are going to be sprinkled in there, so um, just hang tight. Really, really, we hope that. 
uh, this part of the meeting is going to answer a lot of the questions that you might have. Um, and then we're, obviously we're going to have time uh, later on for, for you to, to dive in and ask your, the, your own questions. Um, but, but what I would love to do is to orient you to the plan to talk a little bit about its um, its development and then what is currently in the plan. So, so when you when you finally get to looking at the plan document itself, you're, you're going to it's going to look familiar to you. You're going to um, already be oriented to a lot of the information uh, in the plan. So uh, we're going to go until about 550, 555 ish. Um, and, uh, and we've got a couple of questions sprinkled in there as well. So um, feel free if you do have any questions. Um, feel free to put them in the chat box if you'd like, um, but we'll also make time for, for uh, Q&A uh, later on in the in the open house. All right, so what are we trying to do uh, with a bicycle plan for Jefferson County? We're trying to make it possible um, for everyone, regardless of age or ability, to uh, to use their bike for transportation and recreation. That's what we're trying to get at here. This is mobility, um, allowing folks to get to where they're going uh, by bike. Um, so Jefferson County is uh, is made up of the incorporated part of Jefferson County, which are the the cities and the towns, and then there are the uh, there's the the remaining um, part of Jefferson County is the unincorporated part of Jefferson County. So what does that look like? Uh, we have about almost two hundred thousand people. Um, in unincorporated Jefferson County, and in, in most of that population density is in um, is in the, the Plains area, just east of, of 470. And what that mode share ends up looking like is that there, there are uh, quite a few, almost three quarters of folks that are driving to work, um, and then a good percentage that are uh, working from home as well. This is, and this is information that's based on um, uh, you, you may be thinking, how has the pandemic um, affected this? This is this is intended to capture uh, everyone's behaviors before the pandemic. And so we already had, uh, before the pandemic, a lot of people working from home and then a smattering of folks that were walking out or biking to work um, and then folks that were using transit uh, uh, to get to work. So what does the plan include? Um, what does it cover? What does it not cover? I want to I wanted to be really clear about what's included in this plan. Um, the first thing is that uh, we're not looking at the streets and roads um, in the cities and towns. We're just looking at unincorporated Jefferson County. Um, so that's sort of uh, key number one. The second piece is that while we're connecting to trails in uh, for, for Jefferson County open space, where we're not making new recommendations as a part of as part of this plan. This is really about um, on-street connectivity for bicycling. Um, so it's really just the, the roadways in, un, in unincorporated Jeff, Jefferson County. We're looking at uh, bike recommendations um, for those roadways. So I just wanted to be really clear about what we're covering. We want to connect to everything and provide um, provide a, a complete network. Um, but but for the purposes of this plan, the infrastructure recommendations, the programs, the policies, it's really all about the roadways, uh, uh, bicycle facilities on roadways in unincorporated Jefferson County. Okay, so what is in the Jefferson County bike plan? Uh, there's an introduction chapter which kind of explains basically what I, what I did, but but to maybe a greater degree about why we need a bicycle plan, um, why bicycling is important uh, for transportation and recreation. Um, we talk about what the existing conditions for bicycling today. Uh, so that's chapter two. We then offer up uh, our recommended um, uh, networks for both the plains and the mountains. And we'll explain why that distinction is important um, in just a little bit. In addition to the infrastructure recommendations, we also include recommendations that are more specific to policies, programs, planning efforts, um, uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and then finally, the, the last chapter is about how we get there. Uh, we have all these recommendations, this universe of things that we could do. How do we actually get there? Um, what is most important and where do we start? I won't talk through all of these, but the important note here is that uh, the goal is informed and influenced by these eight uh, these these eight goals. The plan is is uh, these 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 eight goals were uh, really came about as um, from the initial meetings with stakeholders and then also the uh, the initial commu community engagement as well. So these are are the um, are, are sort of the driving factors of the plan. In in one way, it affects. Uh, how we developed recommendations, and then, and then, in another way, it informed how those projects, those infrastructure projects, were were scored and then prioritized. So, uh, just something to keep in mind that uh, these are the the goals that, that are really important for bicycling in Jefferson County. 
The project timeline, we're right at the very end of it. Um, and so if this is your first time engaging in the planning process, welcome. Um, and if you've been following throughout, then then we really appreciate you being a part of uh, the planning process. Um, so we're at the very end. We, we went through a couple of different phases of public engagement. Um, the existing conditions uh, content was basically, hey, what, what do we have right now and what are we working with? Um, developing recommendations for the plains and the mountains policies and programs, developing an implementation plans. So that was really at the turn of, of the, the, the new year, at the very end of um, last year into January of this year. And then finally, um, for the last three or four months, we've been drafting the plan itself. So it's gone through a couple of different revisions. Um, uh, it started internally, and now it's ready for uh, the public to uh, respond to and react to. Okay, so that's kind of how the plan came to be. I want to talk a little bit now about um, about the the thinking that informed um, the the recommendations uh, specifically. And so, um, in in bicycle and and really active transportation planning, we think about uh, primarily four major categories of um, of people and how they how they feel uh, about bicycling and how they how they approach bicycling. The the very first chunk. Um, are, are the folks that, and I'm actually going to start on the right side of the screen because I think it might be more instructive this way. The, the, the first chunk is pretty small, uh, really. It's, it's, uh, it, it is the group of people that are going to ride their bike regardless of traffic conditions. And so they're willing to, um, to they're, they're maybe more athletic, maybe more confident, um, and they're willing to mix with traffic of various volumes and various speeds. Enthused and confident riders are maybe not quite as aggressive. Maybe they're they're still pretty confident mixing with traffic, but if if they have the option, they would prefer to ride in some kind of uh, separate bike bike facility. Um, the the third group is, um, is is probably the largest group actually, and so this is based on research um, uh, that's that's been done really across the country. It started out of of Portland, but um, as the, the Dr. Cog, the Denver Regional Council of Governments, um, as a part of that active transportation plan, we also did a very similar survey and, and asked about um, how, how people categorize themselves. And, and this still ended up being the largest group of people. This is the group of people that um, would like to ride their bicycle, but, but they don't because they're, they're worried about their safety um, or they're worried about um, the distance that they have to travel. And, and the only way to really get them to consider using their bike or riding their bike for, uh, for transportation is to provide really safe, really comfortable facilities. And then finally, uh, the, 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 the last block of people are the folks that are, are not gonna ride regardless. Maybe it's because they don't want to, maybe it's because they, they're not able to. Um, but all of this comprises what we believe to be the, the four main groups. And um, the, the thinking around this is that if we plan and we design and we, we um, provide a network for the interest of a concerned rider, that means that the enthused and confident and the strong and fearless, the, the, those folks are going to be safe and comfortable as well. So we're, we're thinking about the sort of the best bang for our buck. How do we, how do we make, um, how do we do the most good uh, with the resources that we have? So at this point, uh, I'm going to stop sharing, and uh, I believe Daniel has some questions um, that he wants to pose to, to this group, and it'd be really great um, to, uh, to hear from you all, just to think about these four categories and, and which one um, you, you might fall into, just to kind of frame the conversation a little bit and, um, and to, to get some, to just to get to know you a little better. So I'm going to stop sharing, and Daniel is going to share his screen and, uh, and pull up some interactive questions here. That's right. Um, thanks, Trunk. So I'm putting a uh, Mentimeter poll into the chat. Um, so you all should be able to get that. And I'm going to now share my screen. And the way that this works is you'll click on the link in the chat and um, we'll be able to have a little poll and we'll be able to see where this group falls in terms of those four categories that uh, Trunk outlined. So as I'm trying to share my screen, you can go to that poll and um, we can hopefully have a little interactivity here. So looks like we already have some um, responses and I'm going to go to present. So it looks like already looking at this, we have uh, a couple fearless and a couple um, and four confident writers. Um, and maybe, you know, that, that might not be a surprise considering the focus of this meeting um, uh, the, the fearless and the confident are often the types that like to um, come out because you're passionate about uh, bicycling. So 
Uh, I think this is interesting. I think that's almost everybody that we have. So we don't need to linger on this for too long. Um, but I do, I will point out it's interesting that at least as far as the poll goes, we don't have any in what is typically the, the biggest category, the uh, interested but concerned. Um, so any, any other comments on this project team or, or others? Um, I think this is a pretty uh, interesting uh, poll we have here just based on what we know about the, the usual. There's an interested but concerned There's coming in, coming in <laughs> a little. There's Christina, okay. What, right. what I'll add here, thanks Dana for that, um, for that really quick summary. What, I, what I'll add here is, is for, for you all um, that, that are maybe leaning more confident than the, the general public is, is to consider um, what it was like for you uh, when you started bicycling and maybe you were not quite as confident or, or maybe think about um, family members or friends, um, kids or, uh, or you know, grandparents. Think about the folks that, that they, would fall into the interest of a concerned um, category. And so it's totally fine for you to, to be confident. I think that's really great, actually. And I would love for more and more people to become more confident. But in the meantime, um, the, the, this plan is really focused on making sure that that uh, people that are my, my kids, um, you know, my, I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, I want them to be safe and comfortable riding their bikes um, around as well. So uh, I'm, I'm probably in the confidence uh, category, I would say, um, but, but I know that, that my two kids and, and even, even my partner, um, that they're, they're probably in the interest of a concern category. Yeah, so Brian, you make a really, really great point. Who are you traveling with, right? When when I have um, when I have the the trailer on the back of my bike and both kids are are sitting in it, the way that I ride is very, very different. Not only just because they're my kids and I want them to be safe, um, but also uh, it they're really heavy. Uh, they're both they're both dense boys. So uh, so yeah, Daniel, thank you for pulling that up, and, and everyone, everyone, thank you for uh, for engaging in that. That won't be the last time that we pull up mentees, so I uh, just keep that in mind. We, we will pull that back up, uh, uh, and it'll it'll be the same length. It'll be the same length. So we'll, we've got some more questions to ask as well. So thank you for for engaging in that. All right, Daniel, are we okay to move on with the presentation? Yep, all set. Sorry about that. All right, good deal. Good deal. Okay. All right, so went to the Minty poll. Thank you for for timing. Oh, and these these were the numbers that I, I really wanted to to point to. Um, so so the strong and fearless represents just just from uh, this this one study, but these numbers line up really really well from um, the Dr. Cog uh, study that that I mentioned before, um, and. And that that study included, I believe it was about a thousand people that were randomly selected across the um, the, the Denver region. So. I wouldn't consider it to be statistically significant, um, but it was it was really it was not a small sample size. Um, and so the information we were it was really enlightening for us to be able to see. So you, so you can see that more than half of the folks that um, that we consider to be uh, more than half of the population we consider to be in the interest of a concern um, bicyclist category, and um, and and almost almost two thirds of people. Uh, are, are either bicycling or would like to, to ride their bike. So the, the potential um, is, is there. And, and that's what we're, uh, that's what we're really focusing on here, taking advantage and, and finding ways to unleash that potential for bicycling. All right, so let's move on here. Um, I wanna cover what's the, um, what the existing infrastructure looks like, and then we're gonna dive into um, what, the, uh, what the proposed, what the recommended uh, infrastructure is gonna look like. And I think, I think once we get to that point, um, we'll, we'll sort of think through a little bit about how we have that conversation. Um, and I think with a group of, it looks like we have about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of us, which is great, um, great size. And, and uh, it'll be a little bit more open-ended uh, for us to be able to have some conversation at that point. So um, this, is, this is great. Okay, so what do we have in Jefferson County today in terms of infrastructure? I'm not gonna read through all of these. You, you can see the, no, the numbers on screen, um, but you can see that it weighs pretty heavily towards um, uh, shared use paths, um, bike lanes, and then paved shoulder lanes. Neighbor bikeways is a facility type that I'll explain a little bit more, but um, there are fewer of those than, than of the other facility types. When we're thinking about uh, planning and, and developing recommendations for a bicycle network for any community, um, but certainly for a place like Jefferson County, we're, we're thinking about several key factors. Uh, one is speed. So you got to think about um, uh, if, a, if, a, if you're on a bike and a motorist uh, passes you, 
at 10 miles an hour, that's pretty calm, right? It doesn't feel like uh, the speed differential is, is really that great or it doesn't feel unsafe or stressful. But if they're passing you at 40 or 50 miles an hour, that's a totally different experience, right? So that's number one, speed. Number two is traffic volume. The number of passing incidents, that drives how stressful it feels. Maybe you're on a really calm, local street, there's not a lot of traffic. The only people that are driving on that street are the people that live there, right? So maybe um, within a certain period of time, you might only have one or two uh, drivers pass you, pass you. But if it is a really busy street and you have a lot of people passing you, every passing incident causes stress. So that's, that's, another, um, that's another factor. The third factor is whether or not there's an ex existing bicycle facility. What I mean by that is if you're just in traffic, you're just in the travel lane, um, then it can feel very, really stressful. But if you even have a dedicated space, maybe it's just a traditional bike lane um, or, or maybe it's, a, it's a, some kind of shared use path on the side of the road, then that provides more, uh, that, that, that alleviates stress. The number of um, the number of travel lanes is a factor, and Matthew, thank you for the question. I'll, I'll get to that in, in a second. It's a really good question. Um, so the the travel lanes, the number of travel lanes, the more travel lanes there are, the more stressful it is. Um, and then uh, whether or not there's parking, and if that bike lane is in uh, is, is in between the travel lanes and the parking lane, that that can end up being um, being really stressful. So so Matthew, I want to pause and actually answer this question because I think it's really interesting. Uh, Matthew's asking when we're talking about speed, are we talking about absolute speed or are we talking about relative speed? In a way, we're talking about both actually. Um, but but for the but for the analysis, the level of traffic stress, just methodology, we're looking at um, at absolute speed knowing that the typical uh, bicyclist speed is 10 miles an hour, right? So, so when you, if, if you think about the average bicyclist riding 10 miles an hour, I, I say that relative speed, the speed differential, if it gets to be 15 or more, that's when it starts to feel kind of stressful. So you can imagine you're riding at 10 miles an hour, a driver passes you at 20 miles an hour, so the speed differential is 10. That's not that bad. If they're if they're passing at thirty miles an hour, that's that's a differential of twenty, and that that starts to feel pretty uncomfortable. Um, it's the same thing actually. Uh, if you're thinking about people walking, people bicycling, if uh, if if someone is walking, they're walking at you know fairly slow, uh, maybe three four miles an hour, and a bicyclist is passing them at. 25, maybe 30 miles an hour, that, that's really stressful for, for both the, the bicyclist and, and the pedestrian. So thank you, Matthew, for asking the question. Okay, um, let's see. Oh, another question here. Do you consider hills more stressful up than down in windiness visibility? Very interesting. Those are not necessarily um, factors in a typical level of traffic stress analysis, um, but, but certainly if you're climbing a hill or, or even going downhill, um, th those are factors. So we'll, we'll get to, when we talk about the, um, the mountains network, we'll get to talk about some of the design treatments that help to alleviate the stress, especially for bicyclists who are climbing uphill um, and are maybe traveling a little bit slower and then uh, with, with maybe pressure from motorists behind them, uh, which, I, which I know is a, um, that, that can be a common occurrence. Okay, uh, let's move on to the recommended bicycle network um, for both the the plains and the mountains. And and I promise I would uh, I would explain uh, what I what I meant by these. And we're gonna we're gonna actually uh, get through these fairly quickly because I want to get to uh, the point where we can have some discussion as a group here. Uh, the point that I want to make is that while Jefferson County is a single county, there are two very distinct contexts. Um, one is the, the plains, which is shown here highlighted in blue and sort of the north, uh, northeastern third or, or so a quarter of the, the county. And then the other, uh, the, the, the rest of the county, we consider to be sort of in this mountains co context. And the two, the, there's really two differences um, that I would think about when I consider uh, these two contexts. One is that the street network is just different. It, it's just there's there are more local neighborhood streets in the plains um, that can get you around without maybe even having any kind of dedicated um, uh, a bicycle infrastructure, right? Uh, whereas in the mountains, the, the network is just it's it's more um, it's more constrained, right? So you only have so many roads going to um, certain places of the county. The the other is that the plains are flatter, all right? So so um, Brian, to your question about hills, uh, the plains are flatter, whereas the the mountains there are more topographical constraints, and and not only that, but um, not, not only with the grades, but also just with the the space that we have. 
um, to uh, to actually build out any kind of improvements to, to make it better um, for, for bicycling. So um, that's why we knew from the very beginning that we needed to take a pretty, pretty customized look at both of these contexts. And so um, we're going to end up uh, really tackling tackling both of them in our in our discussion. So I want to pause here and actually I'm going to ask Elaine and Christina first to see if there's anything else that we want to cover before we go into discussion. And then I'll see if anyone has any questions before we go. Any any of the uh, the attendees have questions before we go into discussion. So let me let me pause and um, and see if Elaine and Christina have anything else to add before we move on. I don't personally have anything. Thanks, John. All right. Good deal. Thank you, Christina and Elena. Um, Elena, I want to make sure I didn't. <laughs> nope, nothing for me. Thanks, John. Okay, good deal. All right. Well, um, so for folks in, in the room, I, I want to pause and just see if there's anything that I can clarify. Thank you for um, for uh, putting those questions in the chat box. Anything that, that we can clarify as a project team um, before we go into more of a uh, more of a discussion for the rest of our time together? Anyone has have any questions? Feel free to unmute if you'd like, or if you uh, want to throw a question into the chat box, that's totally fine as well. Um, and uh, and if not now, then then we'll certainly have time later um, in the the meeting to to go back and forth with some questions as well. Any anyone have any any burning questions at this point? All right. Okay. So we will go ahead and move on to our. A breakout dis discussion, um, and, and actually, it starts with just a little more, a little more context. And so, um, I'm going to pull this up, and uh, and just kind of explain um, some some of the context, so that uh, when we're talking about these facility types, um, you're from you're familiar with them, and um, and you have some sense of, of what they what they look like. So, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again one more time here, and um, hold on one moment. Okay, all right, so. I want to start by talking about um, the, the facilities that we as a team considered for uh, the Plains Network. So I already, I already talked about how they're different, the Plains and the, the mountains, the contexts are different. And because the contexts are different, um, the, the recommended facility types are, are different. So starting with the facility types that we were considering for, um, for the Plains and um, what, what, what I want to what I want to mention here is that um, this is this is a plan, right? This is a countywide plan, and so we're looking at a pretty high level, um, pretty high, pretty high altitude. So I wouldn't I wouldn't um, I wouldn't encourage you to really get into the weeds here because uh, there needs to be more study in the future uh, for these types of facilities to get implemented on any given street. But for now, um, sort of the general conversation is, is helpful to have um, around, these, around these facility types. So um, shared use paths are, are uh, basically paved places behind the curb, right? So they're separated um, from the, the, the sort of street level, the travel lanes, parking, whatever is in the street. Um, they're, they're typically, um, they accommodate people walking and bicycling. So it, it feels like a wide sidewalk, right? Um, so we call those shared use paths. In general, we consider them for, for major arterials. Um, and um, and we, we think about uh, that being sort of like the, being one of the, the most comfortable ways um, that you can provide space for people bicycling. Uh, very often, and I'm sure many of us in, in this room have, um, have talked to people that say, "Hey, I, I would I would love to to bike, but I I'll bike on I'll I'll bike on the trail, you know, I'll bike on the paved trail uh, with my family, but I, I don't want to mix with traffic." The shared use paths kind of um, try try to get at that sort of environment, except it's it's right next to a roadway. The tricky thing is that what happens at the driveways and intersections, right? So there still has to be in in many cases inter interactions um, with uh, with people crossing uh, other roadways. So shared use paths, buffered bike lanes. Are, um, are, are spaces for people riding um, bikes in the streets, um, but they typically have uh, just a little bit of extra. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's crosshash, as you can see here um, in, in the image, and sometimes it's not, but the idea is that we're providing um, enough space for someone to ride, but then just even more shy space away from, uh, from the travel lane. So it's just give, giving more comfort um, and more space for uh, for the, the bicycles and for the driver. One of the advantages of having that buffer is that if you have a really wide um, bike lane, then sometimes uh, sometimes drivers will want to park in it. 
And then if you have a really wide travel lane, then that, that has been shown to increase um, speeding, right? So, so that buffer is basically just saying, hey, this is, this is just a buffer. We're trying to narrow the roadway a little bit and make it usable by everyone. Bicycle lanes are very similar, except that maybe there isn't enough space to have that buffer. Um, so in general, buffer bike lanes and bike lanes, they're intended to be on sort of the, those mid-speed, mid-volume streets um, where it, maybe you don't need really something substantial like shared use paths, um, but you still want to have dedicated space. Um, as you can tell, buffer bike lanes and bike lanes, they're just, they're, they're cheaper, you know, they're easier to implement. Um, and they're, they can be they can be easier to, to maintain. And then finally, neighbor bikeways are intended to be. There's a couple of different names for these, but what you what, what you should imagine is, hey, this is a comfortable neighborhood local streets that I'd be comfortable riding down. Um, maybe there are some people that are driving up, but they're driving really slow, um, and there are very few people that that are driving along it. So what I would love to do, I think at this point, I wanted to ask a question about. Um, for, for this group specifically, now knowing the makeup of the, the level of confidence um, when it comes to bicycling, I'd love to just pause, feel free to unmute or maybe um, use the chat box and, um, and tell us about uh, what, which of these facilities you would feel comfortable riding in. Um, which, which, of these, which of these facilities, as you see them, you think, yes, I would, I would love to, I would feel totally comfortable riding those. Um, and maybe the, the reverse too, we'd be curious to know, are there any facilities that we're talking about that are shown on screen that you wouldn't feel comfortable riding in? Um, and I'd, I'd love to, to dig into that a little bit more too. So I'm gonna pause and just, oh, Yelena, uh, wanna give Yelena a chance to chime in too. I would love to hear from folks, feel free to unmute and, and uh, chime in the chat box, Yelena. I'm just going to add that um, you can also answer the same question as a driver from the driver perspective of yes. as an, a motorist using these roadways, what makes you more comfortable as well um, encountering bicyclists in that in that space. Yeah, thanks for that reminder, Yelena. Okay, so who wants to who wants to chime in? I'm also not not uh, not against calling on some folks if uh, if, if folks. Uh, need some encouragement. So, who 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 has a reaction to uh, the facility types on screen? And then to the two question, the, the two questions that we've asked: um, what makes you feel comfortable or not comfortable as a bicyclist? And then, um, in contrast, what makes you feel comfortable or not comfortable as a driver uh, around these facilities? P Peter, I see you turned your video on. <clears throat> well, I guess I can start. Um, in terms of these facilities, you know, I live up in the foothills up on Lookout Mountain. Mm -hmm. So I, other than the shared use path, like um, from Genesee to El Rancho, I don't see a lot of these facilities applying to the um, mountainous area. Right. Um, and that's di the difficulty. And you've outlined the, the difference between the mountains and the plains, but um, you know, buffered bike lanes, bicycle lanes, you know, that's just not really an option isn't the right word, but they don't really apply, I guess, to the, the mountainous area. So, um, you know, it's one thing like down uh, south of Bear Creek Lake Park, um, mm -hmm. but, um, but um, so it's, it's tricky driving up here, like on Lookout Mountain Road, where there's no shoulder at all. Um, and um, both as a driver and a uh, rider, I've seen drivers pass me and I was like, what were these people thinking? Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes it's hard to be patient when you get behind a bicycle too. So, But that's just unique up here on, on Lookout Mountain Road. But many of the mountainous roads have no shoulder at all. So um, I don't ride uh, much down below south of Bear Creek Lake Park. So I can't address some of those areas. Yeah, Dave, thanks for chiming me in. And, um, and uh, I'm excited to, to talk more about the, the design treatment for, for mountain corridors. For, for these, we're focusing, this is really the palette 
um, if you will, for the planes networks. And so, sure. um, so there will be a, another palette. Of, and there are some similarities, but really they're, they're quite different between the, the mountains and the plains. So, so Dave, um, what, what, you, what you just said is, is totally relevant, right? There's just, there's just less space and yep. maybe you don't even have space for a shoulder on either side. Um, so pre appreciate you, you jumping in to provide that feedback. Um, I want to make sure, thank you, Dave, for that comment. I want to make sure, I, I think, I think, Peter, you might have, um, you, I think you were about to say something. I'd love to make space for you to chime in if you still have something to say. So, Peter, I think it looks like you're talking, but I'm not sure we can hear you. Um, so, so see if you can work uh, on the, uh, I think it might be in the, in the device settings and Daniel may be, may be able to, to help you out. So in the meantime, let's go to, um, to Brian, I believe, and then we'll, we'll come back to Peter, Brian. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I, I was gonna go maybe from left to right with different reactions because similar yeah. to earlier comment, I think there's, it's hard to say definitively about any of these because there's variation, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> shared multi-use paths is great. We, I, I really appreciate how Jeffco has a fairly extensive network of, of these opportunities. But when they're congested with people uh, who are pedestrians, then the lack of separation can be a challenge because um, in, in some contexts, bicyclists are closer to mid-speed cars than you know people hanging out for a Sunday stroll. And yeah. the other thing I find is often challenging with shared use paths is that their um, upkeep is intended for pedestrians and you know when you get potholes or unevenness or gaps or you know concrete sections that have six inch gaps between them those often are slower to be repaired than a similar uh issue on a road might be mm -hmm. um particularly down in the plains and so i love the shared loop path definitely keep them going and there's a lot of corridors where they make a ton of sense like you know, my dream is we should try to get one that goes along 93 or something like that so we can connect up yeah. further north um but yeah, as well as other things um on the buffered bike lanes, I think those are great. I, the biggest thing I see with those is people sometimes don't know what to do, especially if there aren't enough slashes in the buffer. If it's a mm -hmm. paved buffer, we have a few of those actually um, out in uh, the sort of Denver West area. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find people and drivers and, and riders sometimes confused as to whether you're supposed to go in the slash thing. It's not slash as often, you know, and things like that versus mm -hmm. off to the side. I know in some communities they've taken the more expensive option of having a curb or some other options in there. And obviously that helps make it more clear, but costs more money, so some trade-offs. Mm -hmm. um, certainly the, I feel like for long distances of riding where you're going in a similar place that cars often go, the bike lanes and the buffered bike lanes are great as a more confident rider, whereas the shared use stuff is wonderful with all people, but particularly also with people who may be less confident. And there have been, times where I've often wondered like how much value do we get out of the share rows with the neighborhood bikeways? Um, I, I think they still have an important place in terms of awareness, um, but it, you know, it's, it, it does, it, it makes you feel like a little bit more welcome, but you know, as a, it's unclear as if, if those are providing as much value, but I, I, I'm not gonna appreciate that they do. Um, and I think in all these cases, one of the biggest challenges that I see in some places, I actually think Defco does better than I live in the city of Golden, the city of Golden sometimes is not so good at, is continuity of these, um, right? So you may have a bike lane and then there's that gap for three blocks where there's nothing. Mm -hmm. Or there, the other thing with the shared use pass is the networks get you to certain places, but they often don't get you home or to the place you're going to downtown or, or you switch counties and, you know, suddenly Denver's not doing as good a job or whatever it is, you know, and, and so I, I think there's a continuity element that applies to all these as well. Yeah, I'll stop. There's a couple of reactions. Brian, that was, a, that was an extremely thoughtful response. So thank you for um, thank you for providing that feedback and, and really touching on some of the trade offs, right? Um, that's 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 a huge factor when when we're thinking about implementation. That's that's why the plan can't can't just say, hey, shared use paths everywhere, right? Um, but also we can't say we can't say neighbor bikeways everywhere uh, either yep. because that that wouldn't provide the level of comfort um, in order to, to encourage interested but concerned riders to ride. So thank you for that, that feedback. Um, let's go back to Peter. Peter, have you have you had the chance to- Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wow, okay, sorry about that, my head. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, as a bicyclist, I love neighborhood bikeways in the metro area. In fact, that's one of my projects I hope to work on here in the near future is mapping good 
metro bikeways. So Denver has the low stress bike streets map mm -hmm. that Avi Stopper put together. I'm hoping to kind of emulate that here in Lakewood and then kind of spread out through Jeffco. Great. As a motorist, I'm always hesitant to go around cyclists that are on these unprotected bikeways. So those are my two perspectives. And then also the other thing, the shared use pass, like Brian said, um, going around pedestrians can be real uh, tricky. Uh, they're either on their headphones or not paying attention. You're going around them, you're alerting them that you're there and they'll just walk right in front of you or you get clotheslined by someone walking a dog. So I, as a cyclist, I don't like the shared use pass. I avoid them. So Thank you for that that's my perspective. There. Thanks. Yeah, the um, the share, share use paths, right? They um, they are really wonderful. You're right. There's a threshold. They're really wonderful, and then um, and then uh, some. Sometimes there's so much uh, congestion, pedestrians and, and bicyclists that it, and dogs and kids mm -hmm. and and whatever um, that that it can feel like it's not a safe place to to travel. Mm -hmm. um, so so thank you for that, for that, Peter. I appreciate that. Thank you, Carol. You had your hand raised. Uh, yes, so I really appreciate uh, Brian's comment about continuity um, among the bike paths, or especially if it's an area that you haven't ridden that much before. And oh my goodness, I can't wait to um, map puts together better maps because to have maps to be able to find your way around um, is key. The shared paths. I had the privilege of working odd hours. And so I love those um, on low use times and a couple people from the volunteer bike shop I work in will go bike riding and we'll go and use the shared use pass. We can chit chat, they're super nice for that. You can get a couple bikers next to each other. You can have a conversation um, and you can ride for 60 miles around the C470 trail or something like that. It's super nice. Um, the buffered bicycle lanes, uh, in a lot of places, they when they have that little uh, bumper that you showed um, on one of your pictures, they're super, super comfortable and to know how to, but you also have to know how to go in and out of them. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's an education process. The, um, I used to commute from Golden to Stapleton and you get really used to um, the bike lanes, the bicycle lanes, really great when you have them. The thing about the neighborhood bikeways and a lot of the Denver streets that are like the quiet streets to bike on uh, had traffic or stop signs every block or two. Mm -hmm. And if you pick a bike route like that, I went from an average of you know like 15 miles an hour getting to work to like coming home and doing like eight miles an hour because I had to stop every block or every other block. So the neighborhood bike paths are, or bike ways are great for getting kids to school and things like that, but they're not great for um, like commuting. Yeah, so, so neighborhood bike ways are, thank you for that feedback, Carol. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanna maybe talk about the, the very last thing that you said um, in that, Neighbor bikeways. There, there's a there's a spectrum um, of neighbor bikeways, and you every I, I, many communities in the Front Range are trying to figure out what is the when is good enough good enough, right? Um, so so uh, what one of the one of the the key factors for neighbor bikeways being usable is optimizing travel for people on bikes. So you're right. If you're having to stop at a stop sign every other intersection. Um, and it's it's really it feels really really slow or maybe um maybe you get to a major arterial and it you have to wait you know a minute and a half um, to get across there or, or maybe you, there's no safe way to get across at all um, then then really it's an incomplete neighborhood bikeway right because it's not really accommodating that that travel um, so so Carrie I appreciate that feedback and and certainly neighborhood bikeways um, 
in, in some cases are, are sort of plug and play. You put some signs down, you put some markings down and it's easy because the roadway is already, it, it already makes sense. In other cases, there needs to be a lot more um, uh, infrastructure. Maybe it's traffic coming, maybe it's, um, maybe it's moving some stop signs, right? To, to make it actually useful for a bicycle lane. So appreciate that feedback. Thanks, Carol. Um, Matthew, I see you have your hand up. All right. Yeah, just two quick comments. Uh, one, that the bikeways here, I don't think just spray painting uh, a bike logo on a road is really bike infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't suggest, I mean, it's not going to, the people that are going to bike on that are going to bike on that, regardless of whether there's a bike spray painted there or not. I don't think it's worth wasting money on spray painting that or just decriminalize us doing it ourselves. Um, and we can go do that ourselves. Uh, the other comment I have with bike lanes is that they're only as good as their maintenance. And for about half the year in Colorado, generally November to March, um, I can't use them and I just use the full length of the road because they're full of gravel and snow. They don't get plowed and they don't get cleaned. Um, so if you want to call those bike lanes and actually have that as infrastructure, they need to be plowed and cleaned year round. Yeah, thanks for that, Matthew. Appreciate that feedback. And certainly maintenance is a, is a huge factor. Um, and that's that's something that you'll see in the, when you take a look at the plan, but also we can, we can have the chance to talk about it at the end of this meeting in the, uh, the, the programming and the policy uh, recommendations, right? So, so thinking through, hey, every time a bike lane, well, for we need to take care of maintenance for, of our existing bike infrastructure, but then when we have new, when we install new bike infrastructure, then, then we should also think about the, um, the, the maintenance implications of that as well. So thank you for that, Matthew. And, then, and then the, the final thing I'll say, neighbor bikeways, um, they're, they're really hard to capture in this kind of view, right? So it's, it's easy to see a shared use path and the width and the buffer bike lanes, the bike lanes, sorry for the siren here. Um, but the neighbor bikeways, it's a lot more about the intersections, right? What happens at the intersections to slow drivers down, to make it comfortable? What happens at the, the intersections with the big arterials to make it easier for bicyclists to cross? Maybe it's a signal, maybe it's a median refuge. Uh, maybe there are, um, uh, I'm not saying this is this is true for all communities, and this is a conversation that is still ongoing. But but maybe there's some kind of traffic calming. Maybe it's like a speed tables or speed humps or something like that. So neighbor bikeways. Th this is one way that we were able to represent it just in this cross section view. Um, but there's much more to neighbor bikeways than just sharrows on the road. In some cases, maybe it is just a sharrow because the street's already well. It's it's low. It's low stress and high comfort. In other cases, that we we need a lot more. Um, we mean a lot more in design to make it comfortable for bicycling. So thank you for that, Matthew. Okay, I see um, a, a co comment in here from Brian and feel free to, actually, so I, I missed a, a message here from, from Matthew. Share use paths often have dogs, which can create a risk to the dog and the rider for, uh, for passing cyclists, certainly, certainly. Um, Brian, you said that uh, share use paths are especially good along very busy traffic corridors. Mm -hmm. Um, great for long distances and um, across the flats in all seasons. But yes, yeah, another comment about how the, the mix of, there's a speed differential, there's, a, there's also, it's kind of a, a width differential. And, and really, I mean, how many, how many people taking a walk um, on a shared use path wants to walk in single file, right? They, they want to walk side by side. They want to be with, with their friends or their family or, or whoever. So, um, so the, the width consideration for Sherry's Pass, um, certainly something that is, is really important. Um, let's see, and then, and then Brian, you mentioned um, fantastic point about having good flow on bike infrastructure. Okay, yep, yep, certainly. Um, it's all about convenience, right? And, and for, for the folks that I think maybe many of us in this room feel really confident and have made it sort of a lifestyle to, to ride their bike. In, in other cases, you know, someone might be just looking for a reason to not bike, right? So, so removing the barriers and making it easy, making it the obvious choice, um, that can really increase the number of people that, that are biking. Um, okay, so what I want to do, just because I know it's 620 and we've got just a little bit more to get through. Matthew, thank you for that feedback, and I want to make sure that we have the chance to, to read and digest it and, uh, and maybe bring it up at the very end as well. But what I'm going to do is, um, in the interest of time and just with respect to everyone, I want to, I want to point to just what you're going to see um, in, the, in the, uh, the, the plan itself, and then I want to point you to um, this online map tool that we've created because um, the, the, the plan itself, when you look at those maps, um, it's, 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 the information is all there. 
um, but it's pretty hard to provide really specific feedback. We've created this online mapping tool um, to make it so that you can click on a recommendation and provide your comment on the recommendation itself. So we're not gonna get um, to, we can't even start to really um, uh, tackle the tip of the iceberg for, for this, but we will show you a really quick demo um, of the tool so that when you get to it yourself, you can feel really comfortable um, and then share with, with anyone that, that you know um, that might be interested in providing feedback. Okay, so for the planes network, won't read through these, um, won't read these through these numbers just to give you a sense though of what we included um, in terms of uh, in terms of just sort of uh, ratio. There are lots of shared use paths because uh, when we when we're considering the the major arterials and planes network, we're really looking at we we need to have safe facilities, safe and comfortable facilities, um, and then you also see that we're taking advantage of several of the the already local neighborhood streets um, to consider neighborhood bikeways and then of, of course bike lanes and, and buffer bike lanes where we have the width. Um, when, we're, when we're thinking about the, the best bikeway, the, the best bicycle facility, it's like, hey, let's let's try to let's, let's make sure that we're making it safe and comfortable. Um, and then if it's a bike lane and there's extra width, then then it makes sense to um, provide some kind of buffer uh, bicycle lane. If you if you consider an existing roadway where maybe it actually makes sense to have a buffer bike lane, but the, the width just is, is not it's not conducive to that, then it wouldn't be cost effective to widen that roadway just for a two foot buffer right so that's these are the kinds of trade off conversations that, that we've been having all along and so that just provides a little bit of context. Um, there's a northern section of the plains network um, kind of scattered around um, the, the, the cities and the towns. Um, and then there's the sort of the Ken Carroll area um, in the south portion of the Plains Network. So just wanted to give you a really quick preview. Um, and then I'll, I'll pull up the map after we have this sort of next piece of the conversation. Because um, we have, I just want to make sure here, we, we are having this discussion until about 6.35ish. Then I want to make sure to answer any questions that anyone has. And then we'll, um, we'll wrap it up um, at, at uh, 6.50. And anyone that wants to hang, hang out, uh, we're, we're here. And we're glad to, to chat further if you'd like to. Okay, so moving on to the mountain um, bicycle facility type. So, so Dave, uh, ho hopefully this answers some questions, but we'll be glad to chat a little bit further. So shared use paths are still um, a tool, but, but they just can't fit in some cases. In some cases, you've got a creek or a river on one side and then a, a mountain face on the other side, right? It just does not, it's just not cost feasible um, to, to be able to include a shared use path. But in some cases, we, we don't have those types of constraints and it could be a really great facility type um, to, to provide. One note that I will make though is, and I, and I should have explained this earlier, when we were talking about the, the different bicycle facility, or sorry, the, um, the, the bicycle user types, for the planes network, we really did focus on the interest of a concern because there's there's a lot more opportunity and cost effectiveness there, and just population density to provide those types of facilities. When we're looking at the mountains portion, we're 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 really looking more at the um, enthused and confident or strong and fearless rider type, right? So so we did we just know that given. Um, anticipated funding, um, geographic and top topographical constraints, um, what we can actually do with this plan, it, it, it does, it, it, would be, it would just be near impossible to make all of the mountains network um, uh, safe and comfortable and connected for the interest of a concerned rider. But we do think that the plan, um, the, the plan's recommendations provides a network that is, is safe and comfortable for the enthusing confident and, and the strong and fearless rider. So you'll kind of you'll kind of see that there's a, a little bit of a difference here. And I just want you to, to think through um, what, what, the, what the difference is between riding on a, a plains street and then a, a mountainous roadway. So share these paths, um, still a facility type that we're uh, we considered and are including in the uh, the pallet, the toolkits for the mountains corridor. Uh, we, we're also considering uh, bike lanes um, in certain locations where we have we have the space to do so. Um, but we're, we 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 also uh, included paved shoulders and and paved shoulders are really serving a couple of different purposes. But they're also they they need they, they're only as good as their uh, their maintenance, right? So um, I've I've heard many times before that especially strong and fearless riders they'll say that they, they don't ride in the paved shoulder they they'd ra rather ride in the roadway because that that, that debris gets blown off right by um, by people in cars. Um, but when when well maintained, they can serve a really great. Uh, a purpose of, of providing the safe and comfortable space uh, for the enthused and confident rider um, to, to ride in. And then you can see here uh, in this graphic, we, we want to be really clear about, um, we wanted to acknowledge the 
uh, the trade-offs of rumble strips, right? So it keeps drivers from diverting off the roadway. Um, in, in a way, it's kind of a form of, of separation between the, um, the bike lane and the travel lane. Um, but we need to make sure that they're bicycle friendly and the gaps need to be in the right places so that uh, people bicycling are able to, to bike comfortably um, in paved shoulders. And then finally, um, this is just one example of what a spot treatment might look like. This is actually a graphic from um, from uh, the, a, a regional planning document, um, but this is one example of providing a space for um, for bicyclists to continue climbing, right? So maybe they're driving a little bit slower. Maybe there are drivers that are behind them that are getting impatient. Maybe they get to a corner, a blind corner, and the driver thinks that they can they can actually get around them, but they can't because there's oncoming traffic. Providing this kind of spot treatment um, allows for a more cost effective solution for um, for that type of rider, and it makes it so that that it's, it's it's, um, uh, there's there's a space for them to pull over. A couple of other options. One is um, uh, maybe a, like a smaller version of this, so it's not a full sort of hey, uh, you've got this continuous bike lane, you can continue going. It could just be a pull off area um, if uh, if bicyclists want to to pull off. Um, and then the a, a third treatment that you'll see in the plan itself is. Um, uh, some kind of rumble strip along the center line, right, around these kind of blind corners to discourage drivers from, from crossing over uh, the double yellow line in dangerous, in dangerous locations. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to pause there and um, I, I'm, I'm going to ask this group specifically, what, 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 which of these facilities encourage you to ride? What's your reaction to, to these facilities as a bicyclist and, and as a driver? Um, feel free to unmute or, or chime in, uh, excuse me, in the chat box. And would love to hear some, some conversation around these facility types and, and what you think of them as a bicyclist and as a driver. Who wants to chime in? So as folks were thinking, oh Dave, did you want did you want to it's you unmuted? Well, I um since I already kind of addressed that in my previous comments, um I don't see rumble strips used a lot up here, so I appreciate that, um, at least not in the method that they show here. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a couple places I can think of where they might be good in the middle of the road to warn drivers. Like I said, I've seen drivers pass me on blind corners that um, having rumble strips there might wake them up here a little bit. The, um, the spot improvements, that looks kind of like an interesting concept here, depending on how far it is uh, between those improvements that drivers would get stuck behind cyclists here uh, before a pullout is available. Mm -hmm. So, and um, I'm just wondering how those locations might be identified. Certainly. In the future. Certainly, yes. Um, so, so thank you, Dave, for for that comment. Um, some of it is. Uh, I, so, I think you mentioned two things that are really interesting. One is spacing, right? How, if um, if a driver is like you said, stuck behind a bicyclist, how long are they willing to wait until the next opportunity, a next yeah. safe opportunity yep. to pass them? I um, mean, that's and that's that's something that the bicyclist thinks about as well. Um, and and then the, your your second thought is. Um, was about uh, how how to choose these locations. I mean, the the, the blind spots are are pretty. I think uh, I I would I would guess that um, uh, for for the folks that have ridden on some of the the mountainous roads, you, you know where these blind spots are, right? Yeah. Um, and um, and so there there would need to be some kind of closer investigation of what it could look like to uh, mitigate the the. Um, uh, the blind spots to make it safer for for people driving and, and bicycling to get around them. Um, there there isn't necessarily a, a uh, like a location specific prioritization process here, um, but but it is something that um, is is an opportunity for the future. Sure. Thank you, Dave, for for that that feedback. Um, and I saw it looks like there's there's nothing else to address in the chat box. Let me know if uh, if I'm wrong there. But um, thank you, um, Elaine and Christina, for providing a link to the the online map. Um, so that's live and ready. Uh, we didn't we didn't give that to you early on because we didn't want to distract you. Um, and then also there is a, a page that Elena provided where there are more opportunities. This is, we're really at the beginning of the public comment period for the plan, so there are more engagement opportunities for um, for y'all to take part in. 
Okay, so so Dave, thank you for that feedback. I want to see if anyone else has um so has thoughts, questions, um, reactions as a as a driver or or as a bicyclist to these facility types. Who else wants to chime in? I'm happy to uh, share a few thoughts too. As somebody who lives more down on the plains, but certainly enjoys the opportunity to ride in the bikes uh, in the mountains, <clears throat> um, one thing that it isn't necessarily a facility type, but sort of an overall comment is, it, I think that like longer term, longer range connectivity and like you know big loops and things that are interesting for riders becomes particularly important in a mountain range I, region. I, I also think we want to make sure the people who live there have good ways to get to and from local commuting kind of options and stuff. But like the idea of people going up and if you just, I think someone had a chat comment. If you've got that short section that's crappy to bike on, like that can ruin what otherwise would be a nice trip, you know? And so I think that's something to consider within these. Um, uh, within the different facility types, I, I, I have to admit, I'm fairly impressed with how Jeffco's done so far already with a mix of some of these, you know, I, I think particularly around the evergreen area, like there are some areas where there's shared use paths, which are nice. There are a couple of continuity gaps in there, perhaps um, some bike lanes I, I find more less common and then, um, but your nice shoulders, like I think the Evergreen Parkway does a good job with the hay shoulders and a lot of sections because they're huge, right? So it doesn't seem that bad to be biking up there if you're fairly confident. I, I have to admit, I, I'm not all that familiar with that far right example. So it'd be interesting to see if we have any examples there. And the, the one reaction I have is that I'm nervous that the inside of the turn is often a place of higher danger, yet it looks like it's more natural to do that on the outside of the turn. I, I think back to, I, I can't remember who it was, I was talking about Lookout Mountain Road. You know, whenever I'm going even downhill on around some of those blind turns, I start to be like, you know, this is where somebody is going to be passing that slow biker on the way up and be in my lane while I'm flying along. So I don't know if there's any options of doing improvements on on that part of those limited visibility challenges too. Absolutely, yeah. So 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 what's shown in this graphic is really intended to um, to emphasize providing that space for uphill bicyclists because they're they're traveling. Yep. Slowly, which right? is so, huge too. I think that was, that was actually the common ever pressed enter on <laughs> uphill bike. You know that's huge. Yes, I totally agree. Yep. <laughs> yep. So it, it could be it could be in the reverse if if uphill was down right so if we were looking at if, if someone was climbing up like this uh yep. then maybe that the climbing space would be there yeah but thank you for that feedback brian um yeah, it I, seemed like, I guess this would help with the situation i described we don't probably can't physically fit it in but on lookout mountain if bikers if around that blind turn the bikers could swing out the cars yeah. don't have to be in the other lane and therefore the downhill bikers aren't going to be conflict that makes sense exactly makes yeah sense. yeah so this, this tends to be a fairly um we I, as far as i know i don't think we have this in colorado quite yet but that doesn't mean that it couldn't be done right so we have pull-up areas along many of our mountainous roads for for parking or or trail access um and uh and and this this might take up um about the same or even less space just to provide that that kind of space for bicycles to get around so 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 far it's really interesting this this conversation um because we, we've mentioned some really big network things in response to uh the 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 facility types right we've talked about continuity it all needs to connect somewhere um connectivity needs to get you where you're going right it shouldn't just be it should it should get you to downtown golden and to where you live and then finally um consistency um and actually, the, the the fourth one, which doesn't start with the C, is uh, is maintenance, right? And making sure that the the um, the facilities are of high quality. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Brian, for um, for providing that feedback. Okay. Uh, so anyone else? Who who else has thoughts here? I, I want to make sure that we have the chance for um, for everyone to speak up, and then after this, we will go on um, and and jump into sort of the we're going to land the plane a little bit here, but I want to see if anyone else has any comments before we proceed. OK, all right, so um, if there are any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box, but then also there are um, more opportunities to to engage in the process and um, and Elaine and Christina specifically are, are graciously um, setting aside their lunch hour um, over the next couple of Wednesdays to um, to host office hours. And so if you've got more kind of, more things that you want to talk about, or maybe um, you want a sort of more um, uh, smaller group 
environment to provide some feedback, that's also a great opportunity um, to, uh, to provide some feedback on the plan. Okay, so let me just walk through really quickly showing you these numbers for um, for what we included in the, the mountains network. And so you can see that um, that really in, in terms of just implementability and considering um, the, the number of miles of roadways in the mountains network, uh, we really focused on paved shoulders and really focused on shared, road, shared roadways with the spot improvement. So um, this is just showing you that the northern portion, the northern portion of the mountains network. And then this is showing you the, um, the southern portion of the mountains network. What I'm going to do now, just because I think this might be helpful, um, but it's it's pretty pretty user friendly. And if you do have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out. I'm going to show you um, how to use the the online map. Um, so one moment, I'm going to pull this up and share my other screen here. Okay, so. Um, all right, so if you click on the link, and I, 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 if you already have, then uh, wonderful, the link is in the, the chat box, um, but then it's also on the, um, the, the project website and it's with the, all the other opportunities to engage in the process. So you'll start sort of at this um, pretty high level and um, whatever you're interested in, maybe it's around where you live or maybe it's around where you, you currently ride your bike or maybe it's where you would like to, or maybe this is where you're, you're concerned about bicycling uh, or, or safety or connectivity in general. Um, for, for this example, I'm just gonna zoom in just to kind of a random spot here and just show you that um, every single line has a color and the legend um, on the left side shows you what the recommended facility type is. So in this case, along uh, Golden Road, for example, I'll just point this out as a random example. It's pink. That means it's, it's a shared use path. Um, and if you click on it, the nice thing is that on the left side of the screen now, it pops up um, just the existing street view. So it just gives you a quick reminder of what that street currently looks like. Um, if you would like to, you can leave your, your name. So I'm going to leave my name here. Um, and I'm going to say, I really like this. I really like the shared use path. Um, and I'm going to click submit and then that's it. And then you move on to the next one. And maybe um, you're thinking, hey, I just wanna say, I like this or I don't like this. Or maybe you're thinking, um, actually given this conversation that we had today, I don't think buffer bike um, lane is gonna be the right facility type. I think something else is gonna be more appropriate. That's something that's gonna be helpful for us to know too. The way that we're gonna be using, and, that, and that's really it, that's, that's the process. Um, and I would encourage you to spend as much time or as little time um, as you have. Uh, the way that this information is going to influence the plan itself is um, we're, we're going to be considering uh, just, just the, num the, the, the level and the, 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 um, the quantity of feedback that we get on any given uh, facility, uh, any given street or roadway. And we really, we're going to take it to heart and, and think through, okay, we, we heard this from, from the public, from you all, um, from stakeholders, and, uh, and maybe we missed something. Maybe there's something about this roadway um, that we didn't, that we didn't already know about. And so uh, we want to revise recommendations where it makes sense to. It's going to go back through um, a, uh, a, uh, a prioritization scoring process, um, and then that's going to inform implementation because, as we've already mentioned, shared use paths are much more expensive than, than a bike lane, right? So um, given limited funding, uh, we can only do, do so much um, in, in the next uh, near term and midterm. Okay, so I'm looking at Daniel because I want to be sure that, number one, we're staying on time. I think I'm a few minutes behind. And then number two, uh, thank, yeah, thank you for confirming. And then number two, um, I wanted to, to see what, what we want to move on to next. Do we want to move on to the final Minty questions or do we want to um, jump back into the presentation to talk through uh, the remaining slides? Um, I think we could jump into maybe a quick round of, of Menti, but I would look to Elena and, and Christina and, and see what, what you two think. I thought this has been a really good conversation, great input. Um, it's always a good sign when my fingers are getting sore from typing all the notes. So um, appreciate the input. Elena, Christina, thoughts on how we wrap this thing up? I think with the, the Menti question, basically the remaining Menti question is um, a funding question. So I am curious to get y'all's thoughts on that. Um, of The county is in um, pretty tight financial uh, situation. So it'd be nice just to have your thoughts. Um, it's just a, a small exercise um, on if 
obviously these are real, not real numbers. Um, <laughs> but if you had a hundred dollars to spend, would you buy 50 miles of on-street bicycle lanes or would you buy one mile of shared use path? And this is just helping us gauge our priority, um, you know, and where we should be, where we should be spending very limited resources. And with this group, I suspect that the 50 miles of bicycle lanes is going to be the preference. <laughs> what I love about this question is that it's it's sort of this, it, it is it is the is one of the fundamental questions when it comes to any kind of transportation planning, right? So so a really good um, comparison might be might be transit, for example, bus service. So maybe you want really frequent, really high quality bus service along one mile. Or maybe you want maybe not so frequent, really good coverage um, across a larger area. So that's that's kind of what we're getting at here, and it and it looks like given just the 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 responses so far, we're looking at we want coverage, right? It's um qu quantity over quality. Not that quality isn't important, but quantity over quality is um, is something that we're we're seeing um, as a as a response here, and 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 goes back to the the connectivity um, and, and continuity conversation. Hey, let's let's try to do more, just connect everything. Um, and then, and then uh, more substantial, more substantial. Oh, look, it's already bouncing out. But um, as we're talking, but maybe more substantial infrastructure can be something that that can come later. So it's a very interesting, um, interesting uh, theoretical conversation to to have. But um, it's also really enlightening for us to to get this kind of feedback. I would encourage you next time you're sitting down with a friend who isn't. A bicyclist, uh, or or is a no way, no how type of bicyclist? I'd be curious to know. Uh, maybe maybe pose this question to them and see what they think. What they think. Okay, um, Daniel, is there another mentee question after this? Yeah, there is one more, and yeah. I'll just go ahead and jump to it. Um, so this is really just an open ended. Any additional thoughts? And um, feel free to put your comments in here. And I think the idea, Tron, correct me if I'm wrong, is we would stick around mm -hmm. for additional questions and answers, um, comments. So we appreciate if you put it into the Menti. It's always helpful for our records that we have it in writing from you. Um, but but we're also here to um, just have more conversation about this. And Yelena and Christina and others can answer questions. Um, so I think that's that's kind of where we're going to wrap this up. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, so please feel free. This is just one other, one more way um, for us to document what your what your thoughts are. Um, and this is not the this is not the end. Um, if you don't want it to be, uh, there are more opportunities to engage, and we would love to hear um, more from you after you've had a chance to to dive into the online map and then to, to take a look at the the uh, the bike plan document itself. I do want to um, respond while folks are thinking of. Um, how to respond to this question. I do want to respond to uh, C. Johnson's question um, in the chat box about prioritization. That's something that we really didn't touch on today, um, given just how much we wanted to cover, uh, but you will see that um, in the in chapter five of the, the plan itself. So that's really all about implementation. Basically, we only have so much time and funding and space, how do we decide what to do for, do first? So you'll see the prioritization process, um, the scoring criteria, which then led to a ranking, uh, which then leads to, hey, this is these are the ones that we need to tackle first. What I will say, one big caveat here, is that that prioritization process is, is very data-driven. It doesn't necessarily have that human touch. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at that list as a, oh, we have to start with number one and go down the list. It's really more about, these are the, these are the most important projects and it's up to us, uh, it's up to, to Jefferson County and stakeholders and, and partners um, to figure out how to get the most important projects done as quickly as we can, given the funding that we have. Okay. Um, no additional thoughts, it sounds like, and that's totally fine. So what we're going to do now, oh, we got one smartphone app for bike riders. Yes, yes. Um, having that type of sort of wayfinding in your pocket um, it can be really, really helpful for, for especially longer distance trips. So, so what I want to do here, um, if it's okay with, with everyone else on the project team, we'll, we'll go ahead and say thank you and good evening and really appreciate you giving us your time tonight. And the, and the conversation has been so, so good. So thank you so much for engaging in the discussion, um, hearing from you about this plan um, as, as people that are in Jefferson County that have ridden um, and have experienced or driven these roads. It's, it's really, really helpful. So I want to say thank you. And um, at this point, if you don't have any more questions, 
feel free to um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you for joining us. If you do have questions, we're going to hang out for just a few more minutes here. Um, and we'd be glad to have more conversation or answer questions um, at this point. So uh, for everyone um, that's uh, that's that's all all done with us for tonight. Thank you. Good to see you. Appreciate